morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to our candlelight service this morning. Uh, it's a, welcome those who are watching at home. Um, it's so good to have you here with us. And we're continuing our journey through the Gospel of John. And we've come as far as the 11th chapter. And uh, that's such a special chapter in John's Gospel because there what is recorded for you and I is one of the most, uh, I think one of the most well-known miracles of Jesus And certainly uh, all the miracles of Jesus we can find encouragement from, but especially this one, um, and it has to do with Lazarus. And as we come uh, to this passage, though, um, I think that there's something for us to grab and to grasp because we will all wrestle with loss. Uh, We're all going to lose people we love. And I think this chapter provides some meaningful encouragement in that area. And so I want to talk with you today about addressing sorrowful anger. And the reason why is this, when you come to chapter 11, this is what we learn. Jesus empathizes uh, with Martha and Mary over the loss of Lazarus, their brother. And because of the glory of God, he states that very clearly, that's why he does this, the, the glory of God. He raises Lazarus from the dead. And it provides really an incredible, once again, encouragement for you and I with one of the most difficult things that we human beings have to deal with, which again is death. And then I think under that category, everything else uh, for that matter that might seem adverse or hard, we can draw encouragement from this passage. Now, as you know, uh, the shortest verse in the Bible is actually found in this chapter. It's John eleven thirty five, And I want to zero in on that as we get started here because I think it sets uh, really the stage for the entire chapter. Um, Jesus, it says this in 1135, Jesus wept. And there's always been so much um, discussion and sometimes misinterpretation over that. Oh, Jesus wept because of everybody's unbelief. Well, that would picture Jesus to be some cold and calculated person roaming through the streets here of Bethany. I don't think that fits the narrative of the character of Christ. Some think, well, he was just deeply sad because he didn't know what was going to happen next. Well, that's not true because he's omniscient, because he's God. Uh, Some say that, you know, he was grieving because he didn't get there in time to save Lazarus from dying. Well, that isn't true because he knew from the very beginning what he was going to do. Really, before the foundations of the earth, before Lazarus was ever a thought, God knew he was going to raise him from the dead. So that interpretation doesn't fit. I think when you look at the context, the character of Jesus, and you look at the Greek word here for wept, what we're being told is this, is that the weeping of Jesus had to do with him looking at the sorrow of Mary and Martha. He also loved Lazarus, by the way, we read that. And he was grieving over what sin has done to the world at this juncture in history, and really in every generation and juncture in history, that the great curse of sin is ultimately what? Physical and potentially spiritual death. And that is what the weeping was. And the weeping wasn't necessarily uh, just tears. It was more like an angry sorrow. And there are different faces of grief I know maybe because of my personality, one of the ways I grieve is anger. You know, I take every loss that we have here at the church when somebody dies personally. You know, there are people we've prayed for. You know, you don't want to see anybody die, obviously. You love people or or you wouldn't be here, right? And I know a number of times I've gone up in my little closet of an office and I've thrown things around. That's my Italian temper coming out. Sorrowful anger. I can't believe I can't believe this happened. I can't believe this took, I can't believe he's gone. I can't believe she's gone. And I think this sorrowful anger over other people's pain um, is what Jesus is experiencing. And I think all of us to one time or another have felt that for our own situation and for the situation of others. And so, again, I want to address sorrowful anger because I believe it's here in this passage based on this. And so what I'd like to do is uh, let's just start in the beginning of chapter 11 here. And uh, these verses aren't in your notes, but I'll, I'll read it and we'll build up to where, the, where we pick up here in verse 21. But I'll start in verse 1 because I believe it's important. Whether you're new to this passage or you've read it a hundred times, 
Um, there's nothing like hearing the word of God, right? So here it is, verse, verse one of chapter 11 of John's gospel. It says, now a certain man was ill. And his name we find out, he's Lazarus of Bethany. Now the name Lazarus, as you might know, means God has helped. And God is really gonna help this guy. That's an understatement, but God has helped or helped by God. You know what? That's a good name to have. I might adopt that as a nickname because I want God's help in my life, but God has helped. It comes from the Hebrew name Eleazar. And so we meet this man, Lazarus, and the first thing we hear about him is he's ill and he's really sick. We know he's from the, the village of Bethany and we find out that he is the brother of Mary and Martha, those two famous sisters uh, that we read about in the scriptures. Martha, who had an attitude adjustment that Jesus gave her, she's all right now, she's serving and whistling while she works and serving the Lord. And Mary, who sat at the feet of Jesus, anointed the feet of Jesus, so a remarkable family here. Uh, verse two, it tells us, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So we're told twice that he is ill. Now, verse three says, so the sisters sent um, Jesus an email. I didn't send them an email, but they sent word to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Verse four, but Jesus heard it and he said to his disciples, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified through it. So keep that in mind. Verse five, it says this, now Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus. So note the record, Jesus knows this family he loves all of them. They are devoted to the Lord. Keep this in mind because, you, you know, you start going, wait a minute, he's ill, but Lazarus is ill, but Jesus loves the family, um, but they're devoted to him. Wait a minute, I thought nothing bad was supposed to happen to God's people. I thought that, you know, things like this shouldn't happen. I mean, this checks all the boxes of faithfulness to God and Jesus loves them. What do you mean he's ill? Well, verse six goes on to say, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. So he delays his going to Bethany. You know, he's in Jerusalem, which we find out is approximately uh, two miles away. And then when you include the the really the decline with um, sea level and measurements, um, he's a significant distance away. Um, so he delays his time there. It says this, then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you and you're gonna go there again. You know, the Jews, they, they, kinda, they kinda put a hit out on you, Jesus. You sure you wanna go back there again? And so Jesus answered and said, um, and he gives them uh, this analogy about uh, day and night. Now jumping to verse 11, after saying these things, he said to them again, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm gonna go there to wake him up. In other words, verse 12, the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he might be taking a sleep or a rest. So the disciples are thinking, well, he's just sleeping. You know, he's going to wake him up. He'll be better if he rests, in other words, if he's ill. But Jesus was talking about his death. Verse 14, then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Now, Thomas then says uh, to him, uh, let us go also that we may die with him. And so, you know, again, I told you before, Thomas is called the doubting Thomas, but he's really the courageous Thomas because he says, you know what? If he's gonna go up there to die, they're gonna stone him, then let us go with him. And Jesus then says to them, obviously, all of this is gonna strengthen your belief. And so we find out here that Lazarus's illness, um, it was imminent death really is what was going on. It would lead to his death. And perhaps in our modern day of medicine, maybe it could have been an antibiotic or something that could have helped him, or maybe a, maybe a consultation or under the care of our great Dr. Fred could have helped him. But at this juncture in history, this illness claimed this man's life. And when you think about this, he's the only brother of these sisters. We don't hear about a, a father in the mix. And so he is their protector. He might be their provider. He is a very loving man. You know, 
evidently this family is knitted together as it's put before us here in the scripture, but now Lazarus has died. Jumping to verse 21, and this is where it picks up in your notes, by the way, and for those who are watching at home. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. Now, Martha is posing, and Mary would pose a similar question and a statement. And I don't think it's appropriate for us to just give one interpretation of it because we're not in Martha's sandals. But I think we could put our own human experiences on the table if we're willing to be honest. And it's okay to be honest, by the way, with God. That's really the only way forward if you're going to address any type of sorrowful anger in your life, by the way, whether it's death or anything else for that matter. But Lord, if you'd been here, how many of us have lost somebody we love, perhaps prematurely? And we said, Lord, where are you? God, are you supposed to be in our lives? You know, uh, we're, we're walking with you. We're baptized. We're saved. You know, we're, we're serving. We're, we've got two feet in the church. Our family's in the church. We do all these things, God. How could you let this happen, Lord? If, you, if you're supposed to be in our circle, in our life, why did this happen? And sometimes we say that when we look and we turn on the news. Lord, where are you? How can you let these things happen? And I think that this is a, a very real and honest question to ask. And we know that one of the great, again, results and curses of sin is death. And we see that on display here. But at the same time, Martha is also balancing this with her faith. Lord, I know that you could have healed him if you wanted to. And maybe you've had those questions. Lord, you could have healed so-and-so. Or if somebody, somebody was victimized in some way, Lord, you could have prevented that. These are questions that you and I have had. Sometimes we don't like to say them out loud because other people, let's face it, some people are judgmental. There are people who always have opinions on everybody's faith. And most likely, they haven't walked in your shoes. They don't have the similar experience. And so that's why they think they can pontificate over everybody. You know, I remember one time there was this guy, and he was uh, telling somebody kind of to get over their loss. And I had to tell him, this is why nobody likes you. Okay, I had to say it just like that. This is why nobody likes you. Be, you're a good person, but you just got to learn to empathize and be sensitive with people and be caring with people. We don't need you to rain down the, you think you got to rain down the truth on everybody. We don't need you to do that here. There's no position like that here. You may think there is, but there isn't. And a lot of times that's coming from people's own uh, neglect or perhaps neglect that has been shown to them. Nevertheless, I applaud Martha and her honesty here before the Lord. Lord, if you had been here, this would have happened. Now, verse 23 says this, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise Again, Martha then said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So Martha's not even thinking that he's going to rise this day. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, and this is one of the seven I am statements of Jesus. Um, I believe this is the fifth one. Is a very beautiful statement here. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. What an incredible statement of Jesus. I'm the resurrection and the life. Yes, we die, but we could have life. And then he says to her this, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He puts that right in her lap right there. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. So she doesn't exactly verbatim give him back what he said, because I think she's still processing her grief. But her question represents, I think, a very important part of addressing sorrowful anger. And you might want to jot this down. If we're going to get through it, we need to release our hangups and our hurts with honesty. We need to be honest with God. We need to tell God we're hurt. We need to say, God, I think this isn't fair. We need to say to God, this is breaking my life. I, I, can't, I can't find my way forward. And sometimes, again, I think, well, does that mean I'm not faithful to God? Does that mean I don't love God? On the contrary, some of you have been around a lot of death. Some of you have lost people very close to you in, in some traumatic ways, some of us, especially uh, the, the burial of children. These things are not to be taken lightly. And shame on anybody who tries to wax poetically over somebody's misery. I heard the story about Mother Teresa 
who you know gave her life to serving in Calcutta in a place called the House of the Dying. She was around a lot of death. She was considered to be, you would say, a very faithful woman in her religious practice of service and her devotion to God. And she chronicled one day in a personal letter to a friend about the suffering and the darkness that she was feeling over the loss that she was seeing. This is what she wrote. And I quote, darkness is such that I really do not see, neither with my mind nor with reason. The place of God in my soul is blank. There is no God in me right now. When the pain of the longing is so great, I just long and long for God. And then it is that I feel he does not want me. He is not there. Heaven, souls, why these are just words which mean nothing to me right now. My very life seems so contradictory. I help souls to go where? Why all this? Where is the soul in my very being? God does not want me. Sometimes I just hear my own heart cry out, my God, and nothing else comes. The torture and the pain I cannot explain. From my childhood, I have had the most tender love for Jesus, but this too is gone. I feel nothing before Jesus, you see. Father, the contradiction in my life, help me. I long for God. I want to love him, to love him very much, and yet there is but pain, longing, and love. Brutal honesty. And sometimes we find ourselves in that dark place, that dark night of the soul, when things in life do not make sense and we have this sorrowful anger. But I'm thankful that as we're honest with God, to encourage us along, it's important to remember that God keeps track of every sorrowful tear that we shed. Whether you see it or anybody else sees it, God sees it. Look what it says here in Psalm 56, verse 8. Take notice of what the psalmist wrote. And why don't we say this verse together aloud? You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. You might say, hey, that's probably a big bottle he's got over there and a big book. Interesting, in Revelation, it says he collects our tears, I mean our prayers and bowls, and here are tears and bottles. I think I wrote a devotion a year or two ago on uh, bottles and bowls, something like that. And it's just about God's accounting for the things that come out of our heart and our mind, and even out of our eyes for that matter. And perhaps you have shed many tears in private. God has seen every one of them. You've shed many tears over the loss of somebody you loved. God is calling you and I to be honest. We don't want to sink into despair. We don't want to have a pity party. None of those things will help us. Being honest with God over our pain. And even saying to God, God, I don't understand. I'm mad at you. I mean, it's okay to talk like that. God has big shoulders. And God would rather you and I be genuine than be fake with ourselves. Because his promises will give us strength. Look what it says later on in the 119th Psalm, verse 28. Why don't we say this, soul, this uh, verse together aloud? My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. And see, that's, that's, the, that's what honesty does. When you're able to be honest with God, now you're setting yourself up to be strengthened by the supernatural power of his word. But if we're stuck blaming and being angry and bitter and resentful, by the way, I, I don't condemn anybody for sometimes going down those roads. Been there myself. But as we're honest with God about these things, our heart is going to be more receptive to his healing promises. Does that make sense? And so God wants to bring healing to my life. It's not his will that we, we walk around in misery for the rest of our life. No. But it begins by releasing uh, these hangups and these hurts that we have as a result. Because like Martha, even with our faith and our commitment, like Martha and Mary, uh, we still see dimly sometimes. And, and really, death just throws the whole thing off anyway. Let's be perfectly honest and clear about it. You know, we don't have a file mentally in our brain. We were not created with a file to process death, uh, especially aggressive disease or any type, again, of victimization or fatality. We just don't have that file. We're not capable of dealing with it. 
And so we, we jump into defense mode. And in order to break free, we need to be honest with God. And so I believe that God is calling you and I to be honest with him about anything that we might be harboring. And it may not just be death. It could be something else in your family, in your life. But break free with honesty. Now, jumping to verse 38 here in this chapter, we continue to read the following. Now, Jesus is going to arrive at Bethany. Again, approximately a two-mile journey with uh, approximately a 2,500-mile uh, uh, incline with the sea elevation. So uh, Jesus, then Jesus, uh, feet rather, not miles, uh, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. And so we've already been told in verse 34 that he was troubled. Jesus was troubled. We're told in verse 35 that he wept. We gave the interpretation of that. I believe the correct interpretation is he has a sorrowful anger over what he is seeing. The people he loved is hurting, okay? Again, Jesus isn't this cold, calculated, religious, historical figure. He loves these people. He sees them hurting, and he's hurting for them. And by the way, he loves Lazarus. You know, Lazarus perhaps sat under his teaching, um, perhaps Lazarus was baptized by him. We don't know the degree of the connection, but there's some type of connection because he loves this family. We, we've been told that he loves this family. And so then Jesus deeply moved again. And that phrase there, deeply moved, similar to Matthew 14 when it talks about um, your insides being moved, emotion. Deeply moved again. He came to the tomb. Now, it was a cave because, as you know, uh, their tombs were carved out of mountains. This also begins to give us a clue that this family was affluent, that they would have a grave like this, by the way. Now, it was a grave and a stone, which is another clue to their affluence. It wasn't a bunch of, uh, you know, bushes or something they put there, or foliage. A stone was laid against it. And I want to just submit to you that this stone right now is going to represent a barrier. We'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. Verse 39, now Jesus said, take away the stone. Now Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time, uh, there's going to be an odor here, okay, that Febreze or Fabuloso can't even knock out here. For he has been dead for four days. So Lord, if we, if we break out the crane here and take him out, uh, this isn't going to be good, Lord. And I think part of her, I think, she's, I think she's reasonable in her statement, but she's also saying this out of fear too and not wanting to endure more hurt. Now, four days, why four days? Well, there's different reasoning for it, um, but four days you were considered legally dead in this culture. And when the body... Uh, was going to be prepared for burial and included a cleaning. It included being anointed with spices and oils and then being bound with linen, white linen cloth. And so she doesn't want to go through the process of seeing all of that again because knowing Martha being a, a woman who served with her hands, she probably put the oils and the bandages on her own brother. And so, Lord, by this time, there's a terrible odor. And then Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Verse 41, notice this. So they took away the stone. I believe at this point, Martha, who had, even though, again, I do not in any way condemn Martha, the same way I don't condemn Job's wife. Remember Job's wife said, curse God and die? A lot of times people go, oh, what a terrible woman. What would you do if you lost 10 kids? What would you say in that moment? A lot of times we're hard on people until we walk in their shoes, okay? So I think at some point, Martha's faith, although she's saying it, I believe, she never did say, uh, you know, I believe you're the resurrection of life, it will rise again. I believe her faith has been shaken. And whose faith would it be shaken by this? And so at some point, she has taken her faith back. She still believes in God. She still believes Jesus, I believe, is the Messiah. But her trust in Jesus' care I think, and this is natural when you go through something like this, you know, your faith is shaken. Where's God? Why would he let this happen? And I believe she has, again, nothing sinister, nothing sinful. I believe it's just human to do it. It's, it's just who we are. She pulled it back a little bit. 
But I think when Jesus said to roll the stone away, obviously he could have healed Lazarus through the stone. But I don't think he did it for two reasons. One is, is that, hey, a miracle like this, let everybody see it, right? Number two, what if you're Lazarus and you wake up in the tomb with the bandages on? You're going to be scared back to dead, death. It is said that one of the greatest fears of people is what? To be buried alive. If you're Lazarus and you're healed and you wake up in a dark tomb, you're going to think with the spiders and everything else crawling on you, you're going to think what? I've been buried alive. What's going on here? And so the stone needs to be rolled away for practical purposes. But I also think the stone needed to be rolled away so faith and trust could be transferred back to where it needs to be, which is in Jesus. The stone represented a barrier. What barriers do you have right now in your life that you need to give to Jesus? You know, he's the good shepherd, as we'll look at next week. He doesn't come in breaking and entering or anything like that. We know his voice. He knows us. We know him. And if he tells us to remove the stone, to remove the barrier, it's for our benefit, for his glory, but for our benefit. And she does it. And then Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Even in this, notice this prayer of thanksgiving here, by the way. I knew, verse 42, that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. So we continue to see the purpose of this miracle. And so write this second principle down. Return my trust back to God. Can you say that with me? Return my trust back to God. The way forward when you're dealing with sorrowful anger is to give your trust back to God. You've, you've held it back a little bit. God understands. We're human beings. He understands. But there comes a point when you gotta, you gotta return it back. You can't stay there. Remember what we said several weeks ago. Uh, Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. He wasn't saying, I condemn you for being troubled. He's saying, don't stay in that trouble because that will sink you. That will hurt you. And again, it could be for death, but I think you could apply it to anything else in your life. Abuse, a divorce, any type of loss, problems with your family, anything at all that has put you into a stupor, into a place, again, of being stuck, into a place of despair, there comes a point when you got to return trust back to Jesus. Oh, but I need to see it all. I need to know how it's all going to work out. I need to know why. Be careful with the why. You will go crazy. Anybody want to attest to that? You'll go crazy trying to entertain how and why and this and connect this dot. You'll get sick emotionally. Don't do it. You don't need clarity. You need trust. Another story concerning Mother Teresa had to do with a man named John Cavanaugh, who was a famous ethicist who came to Calcutta because he wanted to seek Mother Teresa and also see the operation of the house of the dying so he could know how to better live the rest of his life giving back. And so as he came there, he met Mother Teresa and he asked her for prayer. He said, when you pray, could you remember me in prayer? And she says, well, what do you want me to pray for you for? And so he then said, I need you to pray that God would give me clarity. Pray that I have clarity. I've come thousands of miles to bring this prayer request to you and the others. No, Mother Teresa answered. I will not do that. Clarity is the last thing that you need to cling to. And it's the first thing you need to let go of. When Kavanaugh heard this, he said, clarity he goes, but I look to you as someone who has incredible clarity based on everything that you're around. And she said this, and I quote, I have never had clarity. What I have always had is trust. So I pray that you will trust God. And I think that's profound because we want all these human techniques. We see it today in the church. We see it today in the church, like in the, the, the American church, not so much in uh, expressions of worship outside of America, 
But America has fallen in love with the entertainment model for church. You see it today. People are seeking a show. They've gotten rid of the cross. They, they, want to, they want to black everything out. They want it to be super cool and appealing. Let me tell you something. It's all about Jesus Christ, the cross, and the resurrection. Always has been, always will be. We don't need to seek a show. We need to seek a savior. And these chapters are a reminder of that. Because in these moments, this is where the test of faith happens, is that I got to return trust back, that I need the stone rolled away, that I got to trust God to do what he's going to do. And so, verse 43 and 44, without any further ado, right? When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, because there wasn't an intercom in the in there, and I don't believe his soul is there. I believe to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, that his shell was sick, his body died, his soul is in heaven. So this loud voice, don't think of it in terms of a loudspeaker or decimals. He's not speaking in the sense of a loud voice so that they can hear me outside the church doors. He was speaking in a loud voice supernaturally so he could hear him in heaven. That's where. See, and let me just, for Lazarus's sake, when you get to heaven, you could talk to him about this. This is awesome for us to read, but what a bummer if you're Lazarus. You're in heaven. You just dropped dead because you were sick. Now you're in heaven, no more pain. No more sisters nagging you to take medicine. I'm sure they were mothering him. None of that. No more doctors. Not, none of that anymore. I, I feel great. This is great. And then you get a tap on the shoulder. Are you Lazarus? Why, yes, I am. You're going back. What? Yeah, your sisters down there, they're really nagging the Lord here. They're, they're really having a hard time with this. You're going back. Excuse me? Yeah, there's been a recall. You're going back. <laughs> and I, you know, we have three resurrections on record in the New Testament, right? Jarius' daughter, his only daughter. The widow at Nain's son, her only son. And now Lazarus, we're going to find out, the only brother of these sisters. It's the only brother. And I think one of the reasons why, you might say, well, he healed so much, but why only three resurrections? Well, Because he would go into a city and he would heal a whole city, Decapolis, heal everybody there. I mean, it was amazing. But why just three resurrections we hear about? Because again, what a bummer to have to go there and come back. And I think Lazarus now is going to have a perspective like that his sisters don't even have, even though they're faithful, is that he now knows what Jesus left to come to this miserable place. You know, it's like, man, I, 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 I got to go back to that. I'm here. I got to go back to that. And then it probably gave him a profound love of Jesus because Jesus left that to come to this to die for us. And, you know, we don't have one word that Lazarus says. Do you know that in all the Gospels? Now, Lazarus never speaks. You know why? Because this speaks volumes. That's why because this miracle is going to reverberate from generation to generation, from all the way from this tomb all the way to heaven. That's why. And so he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, I'm sorry, but you got to come out. Verse 44, the man who had died, came, what was that like? Came out. If you were there, he's dead for four days. Oh, yeah, I saw that the other day on the Life, Lifetime movie. It was amazing. The car went under the water. He, he, he was out for 30 minutes. No, this isn't a Lifetime movie. Thank, if you had a near-death experience and they brought you, you know, you, 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 medically it didn't look good for you, but you survived. Praise God you're here. Bad news is you're going to die later on. So we just keep that all in perspective, unless he takes us out of here first, okay? So, but this guy was dead for four days. This is different than five minutes or 30 minutes or something like that. Four days, he was dead. 
And he came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped in cloth. I think that's another miracle. How how is he seeing where he's going? And then Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. And I'm telling you, I think that's a foreshadowing. You might hear something like that when you croak, by the way, one day, because it's not the end of you. It's going to be, let them go. Let the pangs of death go because death has no sting for the believer because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. That's why. And Lazarus is now a living example of all of that. And so this last principle is this, and an encouragement for all of us. Remain focused on God's promise of eternal life. Can you hear that with me? Remain focused on God's promise of eternal life. Remain, there's a lot of them, but remain focused on them. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house in many rooms, if it wasn't so, I wouldn't have told you. And lo, I go to prepare. I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's preparing a place for you. And I know some of you, I've shared your pain with you. I would much rather the people that we've buried be here with us today. Let's be honest. Oh, they're in heaven. Don't worry about it. We know that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Thank you. We know that. Um, But we're hurting right now. We're hurting right now. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you that. Thank you. And I told you before, one day I'm going to write a book called Just Show Up and Shut Up. That's all you got to do. You don't, we don't need you to wax poetically or anything like that. People are hurting here. Just, okay, maybe a few. So who's going to give a message and who's going to get up and share something from the family? That's it. Hugs, kisses, and and um, and stop, you know, you got to eat, you got to eat. When people, when people are grieving, they don't want to eat. Their body's going into, you know, we think everything's solved by food. Well, oh, the wrong food. We need the food of Jesus. We know that, but... Um, we got to remain focused on the promises of eternal life because this life is so very hard. But I will say this. We grieve, and I think it's, again, appropriate to grieve, but let me just share this with you. And this is a perspective I share for myself, and it's helped me, and I hope it could help you. Really, I'm grieving for myself, not for the person. You know why? Because the person's doing better than ever. They're like Lazarus. If they got a tap on their shoulder, are you kidding me? You got the wrong guy. Do you realize how terrible things were going for me down there? I, I'm fine right where I am. And so it's okay to cry. It's okay to have a sorrowful anger. Balance it, though, with being focused on this promise of eternal life. See, death is going to bite us, but we know that God has the final say. Before we read our closing verse, I came across this story um, a while ago and read a little bit deeper recently uh, to check it out, and I found it very interesting. And it was a rancher who shared this. He said, a rattlesnake bit one of my sheep in the face. And it's the deadliest snake that lives around our parts. The sheep's face swelled up and it hurt her terribly. But the old rattlesnake didn't know the kind of blood that flows through Sheep, anti-venom is most often made from sheep's blood. The sheep swelled for about two days, but the blood of the lamb destroyed the venom of the serpent. I was worried uh, that my sheep wouldn't make it, but my sheep didn't even seem to care. She kept eating, she kept drinking, she kept on climbing because she knew she was all right. I submit to you, that often in this life, we're going to get bit by the serpent. But if you're a child of God, you're a king's kid, you got the lamb's blood of Jesus Christ in you. You got the anti-venom in you. No matter what bites you, no matter what life brings your way, no matter what bite you get, even death, we got the anti-venom because of Jesus Christ, because we have the blood of the lamb. That's why. And so let hell try to even trick the church to make the church into something else, some bizarre or some show. We're not going to let that happen because we know, just like our brothers and sisters in Revelation, we will overcome because of the blood of the Lamb. That's why. And so I think in God's infinite wisdom, he allowed anti-venom blood to be in sheep as a reminder that our good shepherd has the anti-venom blood. 
And if you believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, if you believe that he's the resurrection and the life, you got that lamb's blood, that anti-venom blood in your life. And so these afflictions that you might have physically, spiritually, um, it could be emotionally, even death, struggling with grief, you got the anti-venom in Jesus Christ. And one day we'll enjoy this promise together. I close with Revelation 21.4. It says this, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Finish the rest of it with me. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Glory be to God. We serve a living King. Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven, and our Father has given us anti-venom blood. Let us focus on the promises of eternal life. Let us give trust back to God. Let us be honest with him about any and every pain we go through, especially death. And like Lazarus one day, we'll hear those words come forth and we'll enjoy being in the presence of Jesus and those who have gone before us in Christ. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for the promises in the scriptures, especially concerning heaven and eternal life. Lord, much of this life, especially the death of children, of people we love, does not make sense to us. And so, God, we need to trust you, O oh God, even for our own death one day. We thank you that whatever the serpent, the devil tries to bite us with, by the Lamb's blood, the blood of your Son. Your Son, Jesus, is the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. We know, O oh God, that we shall overcome even sorrowful anger. O oh Lord, break chains today, even now. May we step forward. Lord, it could even have been abuse or something else, O oh God. Whatever it might have been, any type of pain, O oh God, we give it to you, God. Roll the stone away, oh God, because we want to live in the victory of this promise that your son Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Thank you for the cross and thank you for the empty tomb and one day our empty tomb. We commit these prayers now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen.